we'll get started. Welcome everyone, good evening. Thanks for joining us for our fourth online training session. Um, tonight's topic is allergies and anaphylaxis. We've got David Brown joining us from his living room to teach us tonight. Um, for those of you joining for the first time, my name is Anna. I am the current DS down uh, in Division 176 in Victoria. I've kind of been, I'm kind of administrating these meetings. Um, so if you haven't joined yet, we'll go over some housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, so during David's presentation, I'm going to have all of you muted. Um, if you have a question that comes up, there's a little chat function down here somewhere. You can type your questions in there and I'll be keeping track of them. After David's talk, we'll open up the question and answer period. We'll go through the questions that were asked in the chat. And then at that point, we can unmute ourselves if you have any questions to ask. We've been kind of doing a general discussion at that time. Um, but until then, we'll keep everyone's cameras off and we'll keep micro microphones off. Um, that's about all I have to say. I'll let you introduce yourself. And at the end, we'll talk about upcoming sessions um, that we've got planned. And I think you have to unmute yourself there. <laughs> or I have to unmute you. There we go. All right, there we go. Can you hear me now? Great. So thank you so much, everybody, for showing up. We're really excited to have you all here. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about allergic reactions, anaphylaxis. Uh, for a little bit of background, my name is David Brown. I'm a primary care paramedic with the ambulance service, and I'm currently working mostly out of our Vancouver Island Dispatch Center, uh, which is why I have a beard and you know not fit testing right now due to the pandemic. Uh, within Division 176, I'm the assistant to the training officer and generally useful around the division. Um, so we're going to get started here. So the stuff we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to break it down into sort of four main sections. So we're going to talk a bit about the physiology and symptoms of allergic reactions. We're going to talk about the difference between anaphylactic reactions and allergic reactions. We're going to talk about the treatment at the MFR level. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the treatment that you'll see at a higher level of care. So it's just worth noting that especially the physiology parts and then the advanced care parts, they're really just interest parts. Not understanding these does not make you a failure as an MFR. No part of it is something that you're expected to know right now. It's just that right now, because we have the opportunity and we're not doing the hands-on training, I think it's a great chance to really dig in a little bit more and try and understand some of what's going on behind the scenes in the body of these. Uh, so two big cautions out of this. Um, none of the treatments that we're gonna talk about today are updated to reflect the current COVID practice guidelines. Uh, so if you're involved in a division that is doing duties right now, um, potentially involving COVID patients, you should be following the treatment uh, guidelines and updates that have been provided there. This is really aimed at a general practice. Um, and as well, too, some of the content we're going to talk about is outside of the St. John MFR scope of practice. Uh, having been a part of this presentation does not license you to perform epinephrine, definitely does not license you to do a whole bunch of other things we're going to talk about towards the end. So we're going to start with the basics. What is an allergic reaction? So according to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, who I've quoted from a lot here, I'll have a big reference sheet all at the end. An allergic reaction occurs when the immune system overreacts to a harmless substance known as an allergen. So it's basically pretty straightforward. So we're gonna just do a little bit, who does have allergic reactions? So this is interesting, 15 to 20% of children do actually have food allergies, um, which is slowly outgrown. And then I couldn't find a really concrete number for adults um, for just plain allergic reactions, but for anaphylaxis, uh, it's actually a significant difference. So anywhere between about 0.05 and 2% of adults in the USA uh, can experience an anaphylactic reaction in their lifetime, or it's actually as high as 3% in Europe, uh, which is a number I couldn't really find a great explanation for why there's such a broad difference there, um, but I found that quite interesting. And again, just a quick reminder, these aren't comparable numbers. Um, so food allergies is a much broader ca category than anaphylactic reactions. So a couple pieces of terminology we're going to talk about. Uh, an antigen is the first one. So it's a substance that causes the body to create an immune response against that. So an antigen is a very broad category of things. And an allergen 
is a specific antigen that causes an IgE response. And this is where we're going to get a little outside of the things you need to understand as an MFR. Uh, but immunoglobulin E, which is a very fun word to say, it's basically an antibody that your body creates when it starts to perceive a threat. So it's the same idea as um, like immunity to a disease. So once you've been exposed to chicken pox for the first time, your body creates antibodies that can then in the future fight off um, chicken pox. So what happens with these allergic reactions is that your bodies will be exposed to an antigen and then that antigen causes your body to create uh, some IgE specific to that antigen, even though it's not actually something that your body needs to be worried about. So that's, the, that's really the trick there, is it's becoming reaction towards something that is normal to the body. Uh, IgE is most notably useful for actually fighting off protozoic infections. Um, but in this case, we're really exploring how it affects the body in these allergic reactions. So the first time you're exposed to the antigen, you create these IgE specific towards those antigens. And then when you're re-exposed to it, it now becomes an allergen. And so that's when the IgE is reproduced. So your body's already prepared, but knows how to create the IgE specific to that allergen. And that's when your body sees that allergen again, and it panics a little bit and it releases lots of IgE. And the IgE spreads throughout the body and it has a whole bunch of effects that are well over my head. And I'm sure some of the doctors in the room can probably explain much better than me. But for our purposes, what we really want to understand is that the IgE attaches to the mast cells and the basophils, which are certain parts of the bloodstream that circulate around. So those begin to release several mediators, again, responding to this perceived attack upon the body. In this case, the most important one to us are histamine response. And so histamines do travel throughout the body, causing a variety of symptoms. And we're going to talk about the symptoms in a little bit here. So the difference between anaphylaxis and an allergic reaction, and this is a really key one that we want to understand. So all the, the main difference is anaphylaxis is an allergic reaction that involves multiple body systems at the same time. So we'll talk about symptoms in a little bit, but a patient who's just presenting with a rash on their hand after a bee sting, that's an allergic reaction. And now all of a sudden, if we have a patient who's presenting with a rash on their hand and vomiting, that's anaphylaxis. There are a few exceptions to this multi-system rule that we'll talk about in a little bit, but it's really fairly straightforward. One system creates, uh, is just an allergic reaction and anything spreading beyond that, we consider anaphylaxis. So symptoms, we're gonna dig into each of these symptoms a little bit more and we're gonna dig into them out of the order I presented them here because I'm not that prepared. Um, but the main ones that we're gonna see are uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, so nausea, vomiting, di diarrhea, abdominal pain, uh, hypotension, which is the fancy word for low blood pressure, angioedema, so swelling to the body, your urticaria, which is a rash, as well as respiratory symptoms like shortness of breath. So starting with hypotension, uh, this is one of the really key ones that we want to watch. Um, so hypotension in adults is considered a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters or generally a drop of about 30% from the baseline. Um, so when, especially the elderly, very unwell, people who naturally are quite hypertensive. So if somebody's normal blood pressure is 180 on 70, and all of a sudden it's dropped quite a bit, if they're at 120 on 80, that's still a significant drop in their blood pressure. And that's still something that we should be quite concerned about, even though they don't necessarily fit that arbitrary number of 90 millimeters of mercury. And then in children, it's very similar. It's essentially a, low, a systolic blood pressure that's low relative to what we would expect for their age. If you think you have pediatric vital signs memorized, I'd be very impressed, but it's something really you just have to go and refer um, and check back to when you do have these pediatric patients. So what's actually happening to cause low blood pressure in the body is once the, as the histamines travel throughout the body and throughout the blood system, Essentially, they cause the cell walls of your blood vessels to become leaky. And so ordinarily, those walls are very tight and taut, and they hold all the fluid in your vasculature in. And all of a sudden, they're going to start becoming leaky and loose and start allowing fluid out of there. And so because the actual size of the vasculature doesn't change, but all of a sudden, there's so much less fluid to pump through there, people's blood pressures do go down quite a bit. 
ask. Um, along those lines, a lot of the other symptoms we talked about earlier, they're all topical symptoms. Um, so somebody who has gastrointestinal issues and they just ate a peanut butter sandwich, we know they're allergic to peanuts. That's quite a clear link right there, right? The same someone's been stung on the hand by a bee and now they've got swelling in their hand. That's a very clear link to what happened. And the big concern about um, hypotension in these patients is that it's an indicator that's actually become a systemic response and it's traveling throughout the body um, and it's becoming everywhere and not just in the specific point that the allergic reaction was caused. Um, so along those lines, you will see patients who have been exposed to a particular allergen whose only symptom is going to be low blood pressure. That is not uncommon. I think most of ex most experienced street medics have a story of a patient who did exactly that and then began to tank quite quickly. And it's a huge part of why when we're talking about these fairs in the summer, um, anything with insect stings, as much as pe people, you know, smile a little bit when they come in just to get a sting stop pad or a piece of ice and we sit them down and we wait for them for two sets of vitals most of the time. That's really why it's so important is we can have these patients who won't immediately have obvious symptoms consistent with a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, but they'll just have the systemic hypotension. Uh, so just all of a sudden have that very low blood pressure and then start to go off the deep end quite quickly. So it's why we really want to do these blood pressure checks and why multiple sets of vitals is very important. So we can start to see the trend in your patient's blood pressure. Um, and again, if, we're, if you have a patient who has been exposed to an allergen and their only symptom is low blood pressure, that's an extremely concerning sign. And that's an immediate ambulance call. And that person should be going to the emergency room. Uh, that's a very, very high likelihood of anaphylaxis. And just as a note as well, um, if you're starting to get these patients who are becoming tachycardic unexpectedly, a lot of the time it can be because they're trying to compensate for that hypotension caused by uh, this decrease in blood pressure that they're experiencing by increasing the heart rate to try and pump more blood through. So again, that's just another clinical sign to be really cautious of when you're seeing these patients approach. As we're moving along here, gastrointestinal symptoms, most of the time it is linked with an uh, ingestive reaction. So as people eat, drink, breathe, anything that they can be allergic to, uh, again, the body's recognizing that that allergen is inside the body and it's trying to get it out as quickly as possible. Um, so quite a lot of the time you'll see uh, severe vomiting, severe diarrhea, severe abdominal pain, um, and it's all just the body's systemic reaction trying to flush all of this allergen out as quickly as possible. So angioedema is our next one. And this is a fun slide with a lot of pictures on there. Uh, so angioedema is essentially as the cell walls begin to loosen off, fluid, as the fluid shifts out from the vasculature into the body, all of a sudden it needs a place to go. And because it needs that place to go, it's going out into the surrounding tissues, what we call the third spaces and all across the body. And so that's where you start to see a lot of this really rapid swelling. And there is a few other things happening behind there, uh, but we're not gonna dig into that too much. So yeah, typically we'll see uh, this as a result of a contact uh, or injection reaction. So if somebody's all of a sudden, you know, come in and been stung by a wasp somewhere where they know they're allergic, Typically, we'll see this reaction starting localized to where they were stung. And if we're starting to see that swelling spread well beyond the area that they were originally affected in, it's very concerning because, again, that's a sign that there's, there's, the reaction is starting to move systemically as opposed to just becoming a localized reaction. Um, so you can see it can become quite severe, especially as this image in the top right corner. Um, those, are, those are the same person as much as it's tough to see. So that's where we're start, we can really tell. Um, as well, just as a quick note and a bit of a point of interest, uh, this patient on the bottom right-hand side isn't actually an allergic reaction. Um, it's a similar result. It's called ACE-induced, sorry, ACE inhibitor-induced angioedema. It is nothing that you really need to be too concerned about, but it's quite interesting if you want something weird to Google afterwards. Moving on into respiratory distress. Um, so patients will be presenting a lot of the time with uh, wheezing or strider caused by swelling in the upper airway and the bronchi. Um, due to the third space shifting, they can also start to have pulmonary edema or fluid building up in the lungs. Um, that is typically a quite severe sign of a quite serious case. 
this is another reason that some patients with uh, certain comorbidities, a lot of the people who already have the asthma, the COPD, the bronchitis, um, are at a much increased risk due to anaphylactic reactions. I couldn't find an exact number, um, but uh, known asthmatics with anaphylactic reactions have a significantly higher mortality rate because their respiratory system is already so much more delicate. So again, if, you, if you're having patients that, are, that get both of those signs together, that's something to immediately be quite concerned about. So what causes these? Uh, there's a whole host of things, and essentially you can be allergic to just about anything. Um, and there's a lot of people out there that ex, you know, are allergic to a lot of very strange things. And if somebody tells you that they're allergic to something, you can't discount it. Um, these are all the most common lists. Um, but according to Health Canada, penicillin is actually the single most common cause of anaphylactic reactions, which I found quite fascinating. Um, but again, the food allergies, um, most of these are all, these are all the most common triggers of anaphylaxis, sorry, just for clarity. So again, it's a huge range and people can be allergic to everything not on this list. There are a few other triggers I'm mostly just mentioning because these are uh, interesting, frankly. Um, exercise induced anaphylaxis is a thing. It is my excuse for why I don't like exercising. Um, essentially, it, we don't quite know why, but some people, um, particularly when it's cold out, do go into anaphylactic reactions um, based on just phys extreme physical exertion. Um, it's interesting stuff. Um, there's idiopathic anaphylaxis, which is the fancy way of saying you're having an allergic reaction and they don't know why. And as the unicorn that I found while I was Googling that I still find quite interesting, uh, some people can naturally produce these uh, IgE antibodies to particular things without having these severe allergic reactions. And so somebody, you could theoretically receive a blood transfusion from somebody who has these antibodies and go into an anaphylactic reaction. It's extremely rare, but I think it's interesting. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, at the MFR level, for an allergic reaction, so this is an at this is an anaphylaxis. This is someone who's been stung by a bee and it's a little swollen up there. It's someone who got a new soap and is having a little bit of redness, that sort of thing. It's pretty straightforward because there's not a ton we can do. Uh, we're going to remove the allergen source if it's possible. So if they've still got a stinger in there, just get a pair of tweezers or a credit card. Just gently brush it out. If someone's had something spilled on them that they think they're allergic to, flush it gently with water. Pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, if it's a topical reaction, so something happening out on the skin, do consider ice. You know, look at your whole patient. But in general, pardon me, in general, ice is a very useful uh, tool for this sort of thing because it does help a lot of that swelling go down. Uh, and just ongoing monitoring. So a typical anaphylaxis takes anywhere between five minutes to two hours uh, to come into place. And people can have these delayed reactions where it starts off as a relatively topical reaction and then suddenly spreads and the patient starts to become severely ill very quickly. Uh, so that's a big part of why we want to monitor these patients. We want to be making sure that we, uh, well, we want to be making sure that we're doing a couple sets of vitals. We're keeping an eye on them for probably at least 15, 20 minutes just to make sure. Um, just keep them in your tent, keep an eye on them, that sort of thing. Um, at the R MFR level for treating anaphylaxis, uh, the most important step here is going to be an early 911 call. Uh, anaphylaxis is not something that an MFR level we can sort out, we can fix. It's not something that we can do very much about. And so that's why it's very important to be getting an ambulance coming as quickly as possible. Positioning. Um, if your patient does not have respiratory symptoms, they should be supine with their legs elevated in the air, uh, Trendelenburg. And if they are becoming to have respiratory issues, um, you can also sit them up a little bit, but still keeping their legs up in the air closer into that V. Um, 176's medical officer, Dr. Nav Chima, uh, has a fantastic lecture entirely about the Trendelenburg bird position and why it's mostly nonsense. Uh, but in this case, it's actually one of the few conditions with really good evidence for uh, actually putting patients in Trendelenburg with their legs elevated because there's so much of that third space fluid loss, especially if patient's legs are flat or down, a lot of that fluid is gonna drain into the legs and so they'll get significant edema into the legs and feet. So if we can prop, them, prop their legs up and going back into the torso, that's gonna to be very helpful. 
Similarly, if a patient has respiratory symptoms, uh, high flow oxygen shouldn't be administered. We're gonna give them lots of oxygen, lots of support, uh, and the patient's own EpiPen. Um, so again, the MFR guidelines on this are not 100% clear, and I'm not an MFR instructor. So if you have questions on this, it's probably best to default to your division's training officer or one of the MFR instructors there. Um, but St. John Ambulance MFR guidelines do allow us to assist a patient with their own EpiPen. And exactly what that means to me isn't 100% clear. So I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on that. While we're talking about treatments, we also want to talk about history. Um, so really important things that we want to be asking people, have they had an allergic reaction like this before? Uh, history of anaphylaxis is a really key indicator. If someone's had this happen before and they feel it happen again, I can just about guarantee that it's going to be an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, similarly, what the severity of their reaction was, was that they took their EpiPen and they just went up to the hospital and they sat around and watched them for a little bit, or they ended up in ICU with a breathing tube down their throat. Those are very different ends of the spectrum there, and some of those will cause significantly higher levels of concern. Um, if I have a patient tell me that they're the last time they had this, they had five doses of epi and still ended up in ICU, I'm going to be much more concerned about them than the individual patient that just has that, had that one allergic reaction where they took their EpiPen and they were totally fine. Uh, similarly, we want to explore any uh, ongoing causes and comorbidities, other health history for these patients, because a lot of other conditions do tend to be exacerbated by this. So respiratory conditions like asthma, even people who have existing GI issues that can help key in if you are looking at an allergic reaction or if they just normally have these GI issues. And something really any other medical history that they have there. So uh, we're almost, almost through the slides. This isn't a super long presentation. Uh, I think it's gonna be more of a discussion about what people wanna know. Uh, so our uh, more advanced treatments that you'll see um, paramedics using and then getting into the hospital. Uh, so the most key one is going to be epinephrine. Um, this is the most evidence-based, highest quality treatment for anaphylaxis. It does a whole lot of stuff. It reacts all throughout the body, but the key things it does is help stabilize those blood vessel walls and stops fluid from shifting out into the body. It actually pulls it right back into the bloodstream. And similarly, it causes vasoconstriction. So it helps tighten down those blood vessels a little bit. Uh, sort of, I mean, it helps tighten down those blood vessels a little bit, which decreases the size of that container, which helps bring the blood pressure back up again. Uh, for patients with respiratory symptoms, we will see um, all kinds of inhaled medication being given depending on the level of care provided. So Ventolin, Atrovent, um, we can go right up to nebulized epi in certain cases for very severe patients. Uh, we'll see antihistamines. Um, again, this is a bit of a controversial one. It's no longer provided pre-hospital except in fairly rare occasions. Um, some hospitals do like to provide it because it can overall reduce the length of the hospital stay. And along those lines, uh, steroids can sometimes be provided in the hospital. Although when I was doing some research for this presentation, it actually became quite clear uh, that there was actually very limited evidence for uh, steroids being an effective treatment, um, either for decreasing hospital stay or for resolving patient symptoms. And it seems that a lot of uh, facilities are actually at this point of electing not to provide them. Uh, otherwise, very severe patients may be intubated, receive a breathing tube. Uh, again, just if they're starting to see so much swelling in the airway that they're concerned, the patient may not be able to breathe by themselves. Um, I typically have a much more uh, interactive style of presenting, and so I've burned through these slides maybe a little faster than I expected to. Uh, so at this point, we're really just at the point of asking questions. Um, I don't know if Anna has anything prepared there uh, that we want to start asking questions about. I do. There's a few questions uh, from the okay. chat here. Um, the first one was, uh, this is when you were talking about allergies in children and children outgrowing them. Uh, and the question is, physiolo physiologically, <laughs> How is an allergy outgrown? I am not an allergist. Um, so this is my understanding. And it's that it, as my understanding is essentially that your body builds up these IgE antibody, antibodies and it understands that that's a panicky reaction. And as your body matures and grows and becomes exposed to similar things, so like basically a lot of like foods, for example, all contain a lot of very similar proteins. So the same way humans are 90% chimpanzee, 
So they all contain very similar proteins. So you would receive small doses of exposure to these proteins that cause your body to be concerned. And so you slowly just become used to it. It's a very similar idea to uh, what we see for actual treatment of allergies with that micro exposure, just slowly giving the body very small doses of allergens uh, to try and explain to the body that it's actually a fairly safe thing to encounter. Um, there were, it wasn't much of a question. It was more of a comment. Somebody was talking about how they had, um, they have an allergy to peanuts in childhood. They'd only have gastrointestinal symptoms. And now as an adult, it's, they go into anaphylaxis. Do you maybe mm -hmm. want to touch on, um, how some people say they get stung by bees many times in their life nothing ever happens but then that one time they get stung and it's full-blown anaphylaxis how do we get yeah. there why does that happen yeah so that's a great point um, and it's basically the exact opposite of what happens as you get better um, slowly over time as the body becomes exposed to the same thing over and over again uh, people can have increasingly severe reactions exactly like that individual was saying um, so as the body becomes in contact with it more and more and just keeps reinforcing essentially and creating more of these antibodies ready to go for the next time, we can have these more severe reactions again and again because every time the body keeps having these really negative, ex negative experience when it, it encounters those antibodies. So it just creates more and more um, causing these reactions to escalate. That <laughs> it's also... A Sorry, Pete, just also, go ahead. <laughs> it is also just, again, a very good reminder. Just because somebody has not had an anaphylactic reaction before does not mean they're having an anaphylactic reaction now. Um, exactly like uh, I, don't, I think it was Mike was saying. Like you can, someone can have just a regular food allergy where they get cramps and vomiting, and then all of a sudden, this time, they come into contact with that allergen and it's anaphylaxis. Do not discount it just because they don't have that history right there. Uh, any history of exposure to an allergen with a reaction is concerning. Yeah. Um, one of those things to rule out, if somebody's presenting with decreased level of consciousness, nausea, vomiting, it's not totally out of the realms of possibilities that they're having an anaphylactic reaction that nobody knows about. Absolutely. Um, and even with the vomiting, that, that's, I think, the really, if there's one key takeaway from this, Hypoten unexplained hypotension in a relatively healthy, in an otherwise healthy person, anaphylaxis should actually be a real consideration for your differential there. Totally. Um, Pete just comments that bees get such a bad rap, it's way more likely to be an evil wasp. <laughs> Um, just looking through, I think there was a few people that were concerned about what I was saying with the blood transfusion. That, that is an incredible unicorn and not something you should remotely be concerned about. That was just a pure point of interest that I found deep, deep in one random article. Yeah, there was a question about um, blood donations, especially now since we're moving into helping out with Canada Blood Services. Um, the question was, are allergies asked about when people go to donate blood? Um, I think you were mentioning that a recipient can develop an allergy if a donor is allergic. Uh, I'm actually ineligible to donate blood in Canada for most of my life. Um, so I've never actually been through the process. So I can't speak to what screening they've had done. I, I'm not sure about transferring allergies from one person to another. That's not something I know anything about, so I'm not gonna try and talk about that. Okay, if anybody knows, feel free to unmute yourself and add to the discussion. But we'll move on to the next question. In terms of signs and symptoms, what's the difference between a food sensitivity and an allergy? Uh, the short answer is none. Um, it's functionally, especially in children, this is actually something that I was doing a bunch of reading about. The only difference between a food sensitivity and an allergy is that an allergy has been proven. So in very small kids, they'll essentially do a tiny little double blind control of giving kids allergens. So if kids, like let's say a small child's showing a possible sensitivity to carrots, they'll mush up some carrots and they'll mush up something that has nothing to do with carrots, feed them to feed a little bit of each to the kid. And if that kid reacts specifically to those carrots, then that child's considered to be allergic. Um, so 
it's essentially the same thing except an allergy has been proven scientifically whereas a sensitivity is a suspicion or a belief cool i'm not seeing really any more questions there was just a comment on here for treatments um that and you mentioned this before that ventolin um is often administered um i just wanted to clarify that the mfr textbooks do not um guide you to assist someone with their inhaler in an anaphylactic reaction yes absolutely that's part of it like, really that's an advanced care you'll see from the cruise yeah um Shirley says we can't you can't give allergies through blood transfusion and I assume the AAIA is someone that I should believe yeah um yes. oh and uh Michael Dusso has sent me a text message um in the hospital a lot of the time as well they'll be giving uh potent antihistamines like ranitidine as Zantac as an H2 blocker um, so they do give them a lot of the, pardon me, they do give antihistamines in hospital um, because they do help bring down a lot of the side effects of the reaction. They don't actually treat the anaphylaxis or they don't treat the really concerning symptoms. But as the patients have that rash, they have that swelling, it does help bring it down. And it just shortens the amount of time they end up spending in emergency. They're able to go home. Uh, H2 is a histamine 2. It's a type of receptor in cells that histamine sources act on. Um, and there's a question, can we suggest Ventolin? <laughs> I mean, what, okay, so back, back when I was a lifeguard, back in the dark days, we were told that you take the patient's EpiPen, you put it in their hand, and then you wrap your hand around it and go, and you stick them with it that way. And we kind of realized that that's basically the same as giving it that way. Uh, and along the same lines, some uh, paramedics in British Columbia have actually faced discipline because we don't have uh, like aspirin or ad, sorry, we don't have Advil or Tylenol in our scope of practice. So it's not something we can provide. And a paramedic crew suggested to a family that they should just give the patient some Tylenol. And that was interpreted in the courts in BC as that crew essentially administering Tylenol. Um, so as, as soon as you're, pres pardon me, as soon as you're suggesting to somebody that they should do something, in BC at least, that seems to be largely interpreted as you're telling them to do that or you're advising them to do that. Um, so I'd be quite cautious advising anybody to take medication that's outside of your scope of practice. Yeah, and for the record, Ventolin, suggesting Ventolin in anaphylaxis under MFR, St. John scope, is not a thing. So St. John would say, hey, you shouldn't have done that. Um, there's a comment here. When I was pregnant, it was suggested I go off my allergy shots because they thought I would predispose my daughter to all of my allergies, and she doesn't have any allergies. Um, I think that's kind of in relation to the blood donations and subjecting people to your own allergens um, and passing along allergies. Somebody else comments, be sure to check the non-medicinal ingredients of reactin and I guess other antihistamines. It could make the reaction worse. Yeah, so go when, whenever you give any kind of drug, you would go through your six hours of medication or five hours or whatever you do so have you taken this medication before if yes are you allergic what happened yeah um and sorry just tagging along with that um we at st john ambulance are not providing reactin or any kind of medication like that um it's quite concerning a because people can be trying to use that instead of something like epinephrine and again, the antihistamine medications do not actually treat the underlying causes of the anaphylactic reaction in the same way that epinephrine does. And so what can happen is people can be taking, um, I'm going to use Benadryl as an example, but any antihistamine, and it'll essentially moderate their symptoms until it wears off, and then they'll go into a full-blown anaphylaxis. And similarly, those are... I mean, every medication has its potential side effects, but antihistamines are not a medication without possible risk. 
um, and they're well outside of the scope of practice of St. John Ambulance MFRs, and it's actually not something that um, is carried most of the time on uh, ambulances anymore. It's just the advanced care and critical care paramedics that carry it now. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so someone comments here that they're a St. John MFR instructor, and for the past few years, they're teaching students how to actually give the EpiPen. Um, so I, I had a good, good chat with a couple MFR instructors, some 176 here, and the whole issue that we couldn't become 100% clear on is what the circumstances of it are. Like if a patient hands you their EpiPen, do you take the EpiPen and stick them with it? Is there a level of implied consent if a patient has this massive angioedema in their mouth and neck and can't actually speak to give you verbal consent? It just wasn't 100% clear to me. And it doesn't seem like there's a really clear guideline in the MFR training. Um, so that's where really I think we're going to suggest the default to listening to what your training instructors and your division does. Absolutely. Um, Pete says, are you aware of the theory that elimination of hookworm infestations in our culture is a causative factor in the rise of autoimmune disease and severe allergic reactions? So there's, um, there's a lot of things. Like it, it, there, it is a very real thing that um, environmental allergies, allergies in children is on a significant rise. Um, more and more children every year are being developed, diagnosed with environmental allergies. There hasn't been a really, there, there has not been a high quality evidence-based answer to that. Um, there seems to be a very high correlation between um, children that grow up in a city versus who grow up rurally. Children growing up in the city are gonna be more likely to develop environmental allergies over their life. Similarly, there seems to be an even greater correlation to children who grow up around animals and farms. Um, but in terms of really high quality evidence, there isn't anything there yet. Um, I think it's something that a lot of people are doing a lot of studying on, but that's a huge long-term study. So I think it'll be quite a while before we have a really good answer to that. Uh, GMO crops has nothing to do with allergies, and I'm just going to throw that right out there now. Um, GMO crops are safe, effective, and a really important thing for our life, and I'm just going to use my little moment to preach that. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you maybe want to touch on the indications of when you would give epi and if there are any contra, contra indications yeah. um i mean this has been a really interesting one actually i've seen because i remember you know five years ago when i was just getting into the field you know you gave your dose of epi five minutes apart and you gave a maximum you know 0.3 milligrams and now we're getting i think we're just learning again and again that epi is the most effective way of treating it and so now we're giving up to half a milligram every every three minutes um, Generally speaking, any anaphylactic patient is going to be getting epinephrine. So any patient that's experiencing that multi-systemic reaction is going to get at least one dose of epi quite quickly. Um, it's generally speaking actually quite a safe medication. Like everything, it does have its potential side effects, but at the doses we're giving it, it is a relatively low risk medication to give with a very high yield in terms of healing the patient. Um, I think everyone who's gone through PCP has been um, told of those unicorn patients that are allergic to some of the you know, small chemicals that are used to make regular epi in you know, the lab epi and they need their special organic non-GMO um, epi. Um, generally speaking, that is exceedingly rare. And even then, I would probably be giving those patients epinephrine everywhere. Anyways, um, generally it's better to be give an epinephrine and not have an anaphylactic reaction versus any of the other potential causes such as, you know, there's, there's a risk for arrhythmia, arrhythmias, there's a risk for a few other issues, but generally speaking, the, any potential risks are much better than the risks of not giving that medication. Um, Mike says, back in the day, the adult dose of epi was 0 0.6. And that's, that's where even now, I think in the last year or so um, at the BC ambulance level, there's been a change in the treatment guidelines moving from a maximum dose of 0 0.3 milligrams uh, to a maximum dose of to giving a little more discretion to give anywhere from the 0 0.3 right up to 0 0.5. Um, the last anaphylactic reaction I did on CAR was an extremely severe reaction that immediately we got in there. We, I think we ended up giving three doses of 0 0.5 within 10 minutes. 
um, just because it was a very severe patient. So again, someone who has most, you know, maybe just has you know, an upset stomach and they do have that rash, yes, we want to start giving them epi, but it's not that immediate life-threatening condition. We can start with 0 0.3 milligrams and give them a little more time to see how they progress that way. Um, yes, um, Mike's comment, 0 0.3 is an entirely arbitrary number that somebody picked um, and became a world standard. There's an interesting article about it I'll try and find and see if we can include with the video of this. But it really came down to one doctor in a hospital decided 0 0.3 was a good number, good amount of epi to give. And then that spread as an international standard. Yeah, everyone has their own protocols. Do your own um, protocols as you've been instructed. Mm -hmm. um, so this, okay, so this, this great question, Austin, because this crosses in with uh, some of my other interests. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm quite active in outdoor backcountry recreation and have a real interest in like backwoods and wilderness resuscitation. EpiPens are designed to provide one dose of 0.3 milligrams. Um, the PD pens, like the teeny tiny kids ones, provide 0.15. Um, but the same allergics, uh, the box ones that talk to you, provide 0.3 as well. Almost all of those can have to have more than 0 0.3 milligrams of epi in them just to keep it stable. Most of them carry between uh, one and two milligrams of epi, but they're only designed to provide one dose and then be done. Um, so if you're into hiking, backpacking, camping, there are some fantastic YouTube videos out there that actually show you how to take apart an EpiPen and get multiple doses out of it. That said, do not do that on a St. John Ambulance duty. Do not do that on a St. John Ambulance duty, please. Um, but it is an interesting piece of trivia. Um, and the same reason, you know, yes, we're mostly using our Epi at 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 milligrams, but it still comes in the one milligram file. Uh, just because that's about what we need to keep it shelf stable over time. Uh, Mike just comments that historically it was the Epi manufacturer who started the 0 0.3 dose. Yeah, who knows? Um, BC Ambulance was using that for a while and recently we've said, hey, you should actually, you can actually give a whole lot more. Um, so that's where we've moved. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's one of those ones, initially they were, you know, they were quite concerned and we would give some Benadryl and see if that made them better. And then we would sit on them for a little bit. Whereas now we've really just moved to giving Epi fast, hard and early because it's very clear that that's what saves lives. Um, a daily maximum of epi, you kind of have to keep giving it until either they get better. Um, again, typically, either at the St. John Ambulance level if we're giving the epi pen, if somebody ends up, you know, if, if you're 20 minutes away from an ambulance service and somebody's carrying two epi pens because they have that history of a severe reaction, you're not going to be wrong to give that second epi pen after five minutes. Um, that's well supported with evidence and well safe. Um, I'm sure there is a certain amount of epi that will simply make your heart explode over time, but I don't know what that is. And I suspect it would be very hard to reach that, that amount of epi given um, at the St. John Ambulance level or even realistically at the level most of us work at. Um, do you maybe want to touch on the different types of EpiPens out there that we might come across? Yeah, um, so there's two, the two most common types. Um, number one is going to be EpiPen, the name brand. Um, those are what most people have seen most of the time. They're the long tube um, with the, so they come in a long clear plastic tube. You flip open the cap and pull out the long tube. It's about the size of a pen, but quite a bit thicker. Um, it's got all the instructions printed down the side. Um, basically, essentially, what, I mean, I'm not gonna talk through it. If I thought ahead, I would have gone and stolen a trainer epi pen from St. John and borrowed it for this, but I didn't think that far ahead. Um, quite standard, it's what you'll see in most first aid courses, it's what most, I think, divisions will have as a trainer. Uh, there is also another brand called Allergect. I know about two years ago there was a mass recall, and I'm not sure if they've actually re-entered the Canadian market, but I'm sure there are still people carrying them out there blissfully unaware that they were a recall. Uh, they're about the size of a pack of playing cards. It's a short, fat box. And the real magic of it is, as you pull it out, it talks to you, and it actually tells you all the steps in this great British voice. 
um, counts right through, the, once you inject it into the leg, it counts right through um, the timing there. Um, really interesting magic stuff. Um, there are, Allerject is also making um, naloxone auto injectors. If you wanna pay, I think $200 per dose of naloxone, um, it will talk you through the process. Uh, there's a comment here that AVQ is becoming common in Ontario as an alternative to EpiPen. Um, that, that's not a device I'm personally familiar with, but yeah. at the Canadian Health Authority, I'm sure it's good. Um, also, just to mention, there are people out there, apparently like Mike and quite a few friends of mine, that um, you just carry needle and vial Epi. Uh, that is fully outside of the St. John Ambulance scope of practice and don't even mess around with that if someone hands that to you. Um, if you're on a duty and they say, hey, I'm having this reaction, I can't get my Epi to work. Um, it is not uncommon. Um, quite a few people do carry it. Most of them have a friends or family who are quite comfortable and experienced and well-trained in administering it. Um, just scrolling through here. Moving the Abby key. Oh, Mike says allergic are back. Okay. Mary asks, if you do a lot of backcountry hiking, are you able to buy Epi? Um, I assume so. Um, I don't, I'm not a pharmacist. I don't actually know what the rules around purchasing Epi are. Um, I would probably go down to your pharmacy that you're friendly with and say, hey, I'm doing this, I'm interested in it. Uh, Mike's saying you don't need a prescription for it. Um, so it would appear the answer is yes, you can. Um, mm -hmm. um, again, uh, just, just worth mentioning, sorry, because I don't know Mary. Um, again, this is not a medication that you should be carrying just because it seems interesting. The same way, like when I'm backpacking, I volunteer with a few organizations. We see people carrying equipment, you know, they've got their chest decompression kits and chest seals and all the stuff that they're not appropriately trained to use. Um, if, oh, with that, Mary, sorry, when it's just the first name of people out there. Um, it's really just worth mentioning that if you're not trained to use it, that's not a medication that you should be taking out into the world and it's just because it's useful to have. Um, Mary, send me a message. Oh, yeah, I got some ahead of Nick comments, AVQ and Allerject are the same product, U.S. versus Canada branding. Hmm. There you go. Yeah. Um, do you want to touch on maybe some of those high impact questions that we would be asking someone who comes into the tent? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the big ones are, I think, the ones I touched on there, um, but really focusing on the history of previous reactions. So what are their reactions normally like? How severe do they get? Um, so if someone's allergic to beets and they decided to go to Dead Beets on Canada Day downtown and they have their normal stomach ache, but now all of a sudden their breathing starts to feel a little bit of funny, we'll use them as our example patient. So some of our key questions we're gonna wanna know, what normally happens when you come in contact with beets? If is it just normally a stomach ache or do you go straight into full-blown anaphylaxis where all of a sudden your hands are the size of catcher's mitts and you can't see your face? Um, what medication, like how, do, how have your allergic reactions normally been treated? So do you have an EpiPen? Do you normally just take some Benadryl? Do you normally go swimming in a pit full of eels? What do you do that works for you to control your allergic reactions? How does this feel compared to your alert normal reaction? So again, just really honing in, is this more severe or the same? And then finally, again, just making sure we do get a really detailed medical history. Um, I'm kind of waiting for Michael Dussault to text me the, the exact stat, but um, folks with asthma have a massively higher mortality rate in anaphylactic reactions. And there's quite a few other, comor quite a few other conditions that can cause uh, significantly worsened anaphylactic symptoms and significantly worsened symptoms. Because um, if you think someone who would normally have just those mild respiratory symptoms, their bronchi, their whole upper respiratory is already quite irritated just from the fact that they have asthma or they have that chronic bronchitis. And now all of a sudden you're adding these massive histamine responses through the body. It just causes a lot of these to go huge. And Mike, if your advice is not to do it to somebody else, don't tell other people what you do. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, um, just, just, just to be very clear, because what Mike is saying there is actually quite common amongst a lot of people that do have these very severe allergic reactions. So for those who aren't in the chat, Mike's saying he normally takes liquid Benadryl first before going to Epi. Like we said earlier, the big concern is that that Benadryl can essentially control the symptoms, but eventually that Benadryl is going to wear off. Similarly to people who've been, who've taken the naloxone course, the naloxone, you know, you've got your opiate or down or whatever you've, the person's taken, it has a half-life of this long. So the, opiate, the, narc, the Narcan is going to deal with the opiate for a certain amount of time. And then all of a sudden, the Benadryl is going to wear off and potentially those allergens could still be in the person's symptom. And they'll have that anaphylactic reaction, especially a lot of the time they're going to have that one in the tent. They're going to all of a sudden have that after they've gone home after the sandwich fair. They're going to have that after they've gone in their car to drive home after the hockey game. So it's, it's quite concerning. and It's really something that should be avoided there. Um, Pete has a great question. The site. Um, so he, Pete's asking if the, the sting on the face is likely to be more problematic than a sting on the hand. Um, and the short answer is maybe. Um, so it, a lot of it kind of depends on the level of severity of the reaction that somebody has. So if they just have a fairly normal bee sting reaction or they get a little swollen, it's really not going to be that much of a concern if it's on the cheek or if it's in the hand. Um, if someone says to you, last time I got stung on the hand, my hand swelled up to three times its size, that's much more concerning because you're seeing in and around the face, in and around the airway. There is quite a bit of potential, even if it's not actually into the airway, pardon me, swelling into the face, swelling into the neck can cause compromise around the airway. Uh, so a lot of that's going to depend on your history and it depend on what kind of reactions that patient's had before. Mm -hmm. And if someone comes up to you and says they got stung, but they should be okay because they've been going through immunotherapy for their anaphylactic allergy. They're spending a long time in this tent. Yeah, that, I would be suspicious of that and hold that person in the tent for you know, longer than sting stop and a bit of ice, because... That, that, that's really, really key here, because these are the patients that are going to turn around and bite us, are the ones... Like, people don't always just get stung by a bee and then suddenly start swelling up like a balloon, um, especially some of these patients that are going to have that underlying hypotension. Uh, there's a real concern that these patients can be fine, be fine, be fine, and then all of a sudden tank because they're compensating very well and eventually their body just can't deal with it. And so that's why even just with the regular bee stings, especially with children where it's their first sting, sit on them for 10, 15 minutes. It's a great opportunity for new members to practice doing their vitals. Um, but along those lines, if you do have someone that you're concerned about, like if someone walks into your tent and doesn't have a specific symptom, but just looks like garbage, that's when you want to be really focusing on making sure you're getting a really high quality set of vitals, a really accurate blood pressure, really carefully watching your patient. And that might be a time you want to start getting a more senior member with more experience doing really high quality vitals there because the differences are so important. Yeah, and there's a few comments here. Mike says that his peanut allergy takes 20 minutes to go from bad taste to bad blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And then Nick says, I've personally cared for someone who had a one and a half hour delayed severe anaphylactic reaction, nearly asymptomatic, other than I don't feel great, but I'm fine. And then they full on crashed while at triage at the local hospital. Absolutely. I did almost the exact same thing. We went to the reserve across the street from the hospital. I picked up a patient with a bee sting on the upper arm. And it was, it was quite swollen. We were, we were a little concerned, but it was still just that one symptom. Uh, had really good blood pressure, was up walking, totally copus mentis. And we walked her into the hospital and while sitting, as she sat down in the chair to get triaged, you could see her suddenly just start to go gray and you could tell her blood pressure was dropping and she was just tanking. Um, just along those lines, um, there is um, recurrent anaphylaxis. So people can have an, an anaphylactic reaction, recover from it with epi, spend some time in the hospital and afterwards go back into anaphylaxis. It's fairly uncommon. I haven't been able to find a ton of really detailed reports of it. Um, interestingly, a lot of treatments in hospital along the lines of uh, 
antihistamines in book four when they were giving steroids were thought to be preventing this recurrent anaphylaxis. And it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any evidence to that for either one. And um, there's been a couple really interesting trials specifically exploring if those medications do prevent recurrent anaphylaxis and there's really no evidence that they do. Cool. I'm not seeing any more questions here. Well, in that case, Nick gave me two slides to plug. So I'm going to plug really quickly here while we still have most people's attention. Um, so for those of you who are new to this, we are doing these every night. This is put on by Division 176 on the island here in Victoria. Uh, if you want to get upcoming notifications about the ones coming up, Anna right here, sorry, we're doing these every Monday night, not every single night. Um, Anna right here is the person putting these on um, and really doing the organizing. Send her an email if you want more information. Um, and then for those who are really nerdy and want to read more about what I was doing, these are all, of, these are most of the sites that I was getting the website, the references off of. Um, up at the top, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology has a lot of really good information if you're looking, for, I think it's actually at a really good MFR level if you want to do a little bit more reading. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other ones in there if you want to go reading. Um, we are recording these. I think they're going to be posted on our divisional YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and look at these, don't panic. And finally, we do have social media. We do lots of interesting stuff. Um, please follow us uh, if you want to see some of the cool stuff we're up to, especially once we get back out on the street um, doing duties. Um, uh, Fra Franco just popped in with a comment. So we'll, uh, we'll mention that. I'm going to be wearing my ambulance hat here, and I'm going to say they will last exactly until they expire listed on the uh, bottle there. So if you look on your vials of naloxone, it'll have an expiry on there. Uh, otherwise, if they were stored poorly, so if they were, you know, if you left it on your car and they've been getting super hot and then frozen over at night, uh, they're probably not going to be as effective and you should replace them with new ones. At a, yeah, at a St. John ambulance level, we're not going to advocate using any medication beyond when it's... Uh, expired and that should be part of your six rights of medication administration as you're um, giving any medication to a patient. Okay. Um, I guess we can introduce next week's topic. Oh, yeah. um, so my email was just thrown up on the screen. If you want to be added uh, to our mail list, you can send me an email. Otherwise, I'll keep emailing DSs for dispersal. Um, where am I going with this? <laughs> next week. Um, we next are week. very lucky. Um, I'm trying to pull this up so I get it exactly right. Um, so next week, we're going to have a really interesting lecture that I'm very excited for. Uh, Dr. Dr. Andrew Guy, who's one of the emergency medicine residents at uh, Royal Columbian Hospital, in New Westminster is going to be giving us an introduction to toxicology and drugs of abuse, um, which is going to be really exciting. Um, he's a fantastic doctor, a really knowledgeable guy, and someone I'm really excited to hear from, and someone that will probably ramble much less than me. <laughs> um, so I will be sending out the invitations. I think we're going to try and um, make this a little bit more regular in how we send our stuff out. So invitations will be sent out on Tuesdays and hopefully the video recording. And then we generally send out a reminder on the Sunday as well. For those of you within Division 176, I've been throwing up the links into our calendar. And for those of you in the wider prov province, um, we're trying to sort out some sort of thing on better impact where you can access all the links and all the invitations within a folder. So everybody will have access to it at any point. And yeah, we'll try and get most of the month's invites out early so you have them. Shanna says, thanks, loving these distance meetings. It is pretty great to sit in my own house and wear pajamas for these. <laughs> yeah, I'm really, I'm really wearing a uniform shirt and sweatpants. Right. Hang out with my dog. It's great. <laughs> and honestly, for me, thank you guys for all showing up to this. It'd be really awkward if I was just presenting to Nick, Anna, and one or two other people. 
Um, so we really appreciate you guys. And I think it's a really important way to try and keep connected uh, at a divisional and at a provincial level. And it's kind of fun um, getting to you know, present to and talk to a lot of people from across the province who I've never had the opportunity to meet. So thank for you guys for coming out and joining us on this. Yeah, and I think tonight we had a couple people from out of province as well. Uh, from Ontario. So thanks for joining us. It must be a bit late, but. Um, I'm in from Michigan for a little bit, so. A couple for folks from Kamloops. Cool. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for those meeting invites. My email address is at the bottom of your screen right now if you want to be added to the list. Um, or if you have feedback, comments, you like these, you want to change something. Um, I don't know, something's not working for you. Send me an email. <laughs> Um, otherwise, tune in next week for Andrew Guy's talk and stay safe, stay healthy. Wash your hands. Wash your hands, yeah. <laughs> and enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, recordings, again, we'll be popping them into YouTube. You do need the links to view them. Uh, so we will be sending those out regularly and we'll build a repository of these meetings eventually. So you'll, you can tune in. Pete says no Clorox, y'all. <laughs> if you're going to take advice from anybody, do not take advice from the president of the United States. <laughs> okay, have a good night, everyone. And thanks again for tuning in.